<laughs> Perfect. Uh, and before we get into this ML reconstruction, would you all do me a favor? Could you go down to uh, this bit of code that I've highlighted? So you, you probably do like a control F in your browser, go to make some plots with these results and find this line where it says plot dot figure I and just take the I out. <laughs> That's a little, uh, <laughs> a little fun coding exercise for you. Uh, it's just to avoid, we were accidentally plotting some things on top of each other and that will avoid that problem. Take the I out of <laughs> Just take the I out of that code. It's not the end of the world if you don't, so. All right, let's get into it. Uh, all of our normal uh, functions, let's go into, a, into our pet examples. We'll go to a different folder this time. So we're going to be working on some Florax data. Uh, here, we'll take our emission data. We'll take our, our emission image. We've got our attenuation image. And we've done some, uh, we've multiplied our, our emission image by some value to create uh, new data. And I suppose we do an IM show to, to show what that looks like. All right, so now we're look, looking at uh, the thorax region and we've got a tumor in there. Yeah? Because uh, we could have a look and see what size it is. Single slice. Single slice that's 155 by 155. Obviously, as we said earlier, we're sort of in, this, in these examples using single slices because it means we can get through things uh, a lot quicker than you would do if you were reconstructing yourself. I mean, reconstru our reconstructions these days tend to be pretty quick, um, but still we want to be doing things to the matter of seconds that we can keep getting on with, with new material. All right, so uh, create our new acquisition model. This we've seen 100 times, so we're perfectly happy with everything that's going on here. Uh, it needs a template sinogram, so we'll do that. For project our data, and now we've got a new, um, a new sinogram, uh, an acquisition array. And then let's have a look and see what that looks like. So we took that thorax slice, the single slice that had a tumor in it, and we four projected it. And probably one of these bright spots, maybe this one, is equivalent of that, the tumor that we saw through there. OK, now we're getting into some reconstructions. Now the, the fun starts. So create me an objective function. And it's going to be the Poisson log likelihood. As Chris said, uh, we tend to um, uh, say that it's a Poisson distribution in, in PET, so we're going to try and maximize the Poisson log likelihood. And um, you could, in theory, add in a prior, but we'll get into that in, in some later uh, examples. OK, now, create me a, uh, a reconstruction uh, object. For this, is going to be uh, ordered subset, MAP, one step late, reconstructor. All right? But as you'll see above, if you don't use a penalty or a prior, this simplifies down to OSCM. So in SURF, we don't have a class that's called OSCM. We always use OS map, OSL, and then you just don't add in a prior, and you are essentially using uh, OSCM. All right? If you then said, just use one subset of the data, you're then using MLEM. All right? So you, for a lot of the time in, in SURF, you'll, uh, you'll tend to use just this one reconstruction, reconstruction class. Or it's, it's, the, it's the, the most important one that you'll be using on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? So create me a reconstructor. Uh, I'll give you that, uh, the objective function. So ours was the, uh, the Poisson log likelihood. I want you to use uh, four subsets, and I want you to run for 10 uh, sub-iterations. And just bear in mind the difference between an iteration and a sub-iteration. A sub-iteration is just each time we run an update. Uh, an iteration would be each time we completely go over our data. So if we have four subsets, an iteration will be every four, whereas a sub-iteration will be every single time. Does that make sense? So in MLEM and OSEM, every iteration is one sub-iteration. If I use uh, OSEM where I have four subsets, every iteration is four sub-iterations. It's a time to use up all of the data that's in your sinogram. Everyone on board? All right, and then we're going to just do the reconstruction. So here you can see that I'm creating a, an initial image, uh, which is going to be a clone of my input. I'll um, 
uh, give it a cylindrical field of view. So I'll chop everything that's outside of that cylinder or outside of the scanner geometry. I'll just set it to zero. And I think then it does an show, so we'll see what that looks like. So this is our initial guess. We did do uh, a clone of our initial image, but I don't want you to think that that's us cheating by <laughs> taking our input and then saying, look, it's great. We reconstructed the very thing we started with. Uh, so we set it all to, to, uh, to some fixed value. And then if it's outside of the, the cylindrical field of view, set it to zero. And then do the reconstruction. So here we can say set up to our reconstructor and then reconstruct. And then we'll have a, a variable called reconstructed image that will then hold our results. And you can see that it finishes almost instantaneously. And that's obviously because we're using very small data. So I've said um, uh, reconstructed image. Get me a, we've used this a, a couple of times before, but this maybe it's worth saying now. Uh, if I say as array, as maybe you're familiar with this already, we get it as a NumPy array. Yeah. So you can then plug it into any standard uh, functions that might be available to you in Python and NumPy. Anyway, so do an show, and I've done a, a subplot, and a subplot lets me do things side by side. And I said, here's the, uh, the original image, and then here's my reconstructed image. But this was all pretty easy because um, my sinogram that I tried to reconstruct was completely noiseless. Yeah? I took an emission image, I forwards projected it, and then I reconstructed that. In reality, when you do, a, when you do a, um, an acquisition, there's going to be uh, some noise in there, some Poisson noise. So then we're going to add that in. And we do that by using um, uh, this NumPy method called uh, random Poisson. So I'll give it my, my original sinogram, and then I'll add some noise to it. And then I'll feed that uh, noisy NumPy array back into my noisy um, sinogram. Yeah? And there's probably an M show. Yes. Sorry, just quickly, why do you add the noise in as a float 64? Um, it could probably be a float 32. Yeah. Uh, this fill method, I mean, this is, this is by the by, but this fill method will convert it to a float 32. So I don't know who wrote this. Well, maybe Chris wrote it. Well, who, whoever wrote it, let's not put the blame on anyone. <laughs> so, sorry, um, happened to write it as 64. I mean, it's, you can probably write it as an int if you wanted, and I think then it will get converted into a um, into float when, it get, when you use this fill method to put it back from a NumPy array back into your, your surf object. The, the output of the song will always be integer numbers, but internally the object will, will convert it into floats anyway, because often when you do simulate it, you don't have any all right, and then we'll do the same thing again. So then uh, create a new objective function. Why is the, you scale, do we scale the image? No. Huh? Why is the, the numbers in the reconstructed image the same as in the initial image? Does it always conserve all the numbers, like the, the values in the pixels? Well, you'd hope that if you forward project it, then for the same thing, if you back project it, you should end up at the same place. Uh, sorry, if you, do, if you do the reconstruction of, because you're, trying to, you're doing a comparison between your, um, your measured data and your reconstructed data. And when those two are, when the difference is small, you're happy. Oh, yeah. sure. If there was a scaling difference, then you would, then there would be a difference in there. And then you, you, your um, update would then make the two closer together. Actually, in, in our current convention, there is a scale factor depending on voxel size. So if you simulate the one voxel size and you reconstruct with the model, yeah. you will get the ratio of the x voxel size or whatever as a, as a scale factor. Okay. Can't figure this out. Okie uh, dokie. So then create a new objective function. Oh, sorry. Um, into the objective function, set the new acquisition data, which is our new noisy data. Um, and then reconstruct. Probably do a subplot in which we're going to show 
our reconstruction when there wasn't any noise versus our reconstruction when there was noise, and obviously our image isn't as good. Okay, so that's um, if you just wanted to run a bog standard uh, reconstruction. But obviously, as researchers, you're all excited to implement your own new things. And so in SURF, we can also decompose it. So you could say, uh, reconstruction, run for 10 iterations. Now go and do it. Or you could, if you wanted to, write it as a for loop. And if you write it as a for loop, then you can have a handle. You could potentially mess around with things along the way. And that's what we're doing in, the, in this uh, next box. So we're doing the exact same thing. I want you to run for 64 sub-iterations. Um, our image estimate is going at to, the, at the beginning, is going to be a clone of our initial image. And then here you can see that uh, we do a for loop in which we go across the, all of the numbers of the iterations. We'll do update. And then we'll plot some values. We'll save some values. And so you can see that um, essentially what's happening here is every time I run update, it's doing one sub iteration. So if I did uh, reconstruct a dot reconstruct, that would be the exact same as if I did that. So I've done a for loop where I've called update that number of times. Yeah? Uh, in reality, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say um, as my. Um, as the number of iterations goes on, I'm just going to save my um, objective function value. And I'm also going to save uh, a copy of those images so then I can afterwards plot to see how the, the image progressed as a function of iteration. Give that a go. Takes a few seconds. Plot progress. This is the box where I ask you to, uh, to change that. So if you haven't done it, do that now. Otherwise, plots are going to appear in different places. And then here I've said, show me the, the, um, the progress for iterations, one, two, four, eight, so on and so forth. Give that a go. And with any luck, you should see, you start at the top, you start with your initial estimate, and it will gradually work its way towards a beautiful, yet noisy, reconstruction. And you can see that the tumor, obviously, on, on the, uh, the right-hand side. I think it's the difference between the two. Yeah. Okay. So you, you see that the updates then get smaller and smaller, get closer and closer to zero? It's just the difference between i and i minus 1. So it's just the previous iteration. Sort of the same as what we were seeing in Make large initial steps and then after a while, as well. just make very small ones. And it's all on the same uh, color scale, so. Easily comparable. Um, and then here we're going to plot our objective function as, um, as a function of the number of iterations. And as you'd hope, it goes up. Good. All right. So in here what go is going on is that we're taking some areas of the image which we happen to know are, say, inside of a lesion or are inside of a lung. And then we're... Um, Getting the value, um, getting the values inside of that ROI as a function of, of iteration number, and if you plot that, you should have plots that look like that. Is everybody with me at this point? Is everybody? Does anyone need a couple of minutes to catch up? Everyone okay? All right. So uh, you can see that our plot in the lesion is starting to look a little bit jagged. You can tell me what's going on there. You're like circulating around the... Yeah, exactly. Um, um, why, why am I circling around the, the solution? Because of the algorithm that you're using? Uh, not the algorithm, but there is a... Pardon? It's, it's, it is how I set up the problem. Yeah, it's not, it's not the initialization in the sense of the initial image I used, but it is how I set up my problem to begin with. The answer is that uh, it's because I use subsets. Yeah, and so, so uh, this is, uh, Chris mentioned it uh, during his slides earlier, this is called the, the limit cycle. And it's, uh, as he said, as I'm far away from the, the answer, all of my subsets are pretty good, so I'm going to get closer to the, 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 the real answer. 
But then when I get really close to it, all of those, I, in this happen, case, we, use, we happen to use four subsets. So these peaks probably have a, like a, a period of four. It's probably one, two, three, four, and then it starts over again. And so then as we get close to our, uh, our solution, we're getting tugged around in all those, uh, those directions, which are pretty close to the solution. So you can mess around with somewhere right up at the top where we said the number of subsets. If you want, you can mess around with that. Okie pokey. All right, then we get into uh, a gradient ascent. Uh, it's uh, an algorithm I suppose we wouldn't typically use in, in pet reconstructions, but here the idea is that we're trying to show that you can decompose the uh, sort of the calculation of say your gradient or, uh, the, of, or of your objective function, and then you can implement your own algorithms. So we're gonna run it for 32 sub iterations, um, and we're going to create a, a new initial image. And here you can see the implementation of uh, gradient ascent. And um, you could easily go onto the, to the Wikipedia page and have a look like Johannes did and, and, and program it in yourself. Uh, I suppose you'll have to take our word for it on this one that, that this is what it would look like. And if you run it, And then in the code, that's uh, represented by tau. I think as we go down, we'll see sort of the importance that tau might have on, on the speed of your, of your convergence. So uh, if you're all keeping pace with me, or maybe you're ahead, I don't know, uh, you can plot um, those, the maximization of your objective function as a function of, of, of number of sub iterations. And you can see that OES, OSEM happens to be quicker than gradient ascent. Have a mess around with the step size, which is represented by tau, and have a look at the effect that that might have on the, uh, on the speed of convergence of the maximization of your objective function um, in gradient ascent. So you can play around with this tau value up here and see the effect that that has on, on this graph down here. What's the reason of these uh, vertical and horizontal artifacts in the gradient desk? Vertical, horizontal artifact. Do you mean why does it go up so quickly at the beginning and why does it go? Oh, you're looking at the image. Yeah. What, are you, what are you looking at, sorry? This, uh, great, this kind of artifact that run vertical and horizontal. Here. What happens if you go further down into the iterations? Is it still present? I think so. It doesn't look like it's present to me. Uh, oh yeah, what the, I can see maybe two that are coming right down here. But can you see it in this one? I suppose here the noise is too great. Does implementation loops for the gradient or goes um, coordinate wise? Sorry, say again? And, uh, it looks for the gradient and then move diagonally or oblique, or it goes coordinate it, wise, it, it, one it, coordinate and then the other? It could, uh, it could move in, in any direction. <laughs> Mm. 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 Mm.
So, yeah, but it, each of the pixels uh, are one coding. So you, you may mm. do the, the, the improvement coding, what's the improvement one coordinate, and then the second one, or you can look for the gradient in your own space. Yeah, right, it's strange, isn't it? You can see them here. In, in our models, so maybe it could be rendering that. that yeah, I don't, know. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't know. Anyway, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we get all we'll the same. <laughs> you can mess around with your tab down here and see what that does to it. Maybe it's aviation. You can look at the right properties of your matrices and find maximum values, minimum values, and so on. Then you can say, oh, for this matrix, if you compute that, you know what your maximum step size should be. Yes, but for that you can't really do that because it depends on the observation, depends on normalization, and all of those things. Maybe it's and that's why in fact nobody's really using this because for every patient you need to tune your step size again, and tuning the step size will take just a long time. And you can do, you can replace fixed step size with, with line search. There is actually an example that does that. Uh, so I put in a massive towel and I broke everything. Uh, so that was probably a bad value of towel to go. Go for a towel value of, of 0.1. Better, but presumably the step sizes we're taking are too large. So we keep jumping over whatever the good solution is, right? So then if I go right off to, off to the other end of the spectrum, I'm probably getting too small. And then I, I'm, I suppose I'll be converging, but I'm converging slower. Yeah. Anyway, and then I think I can plot uh, the two of them compared to each other. Well, my GAs here happen, my gradient ascent images happen to look really bad because I messed with that tau value. I suppose now they should look comparable. You'd say that the uh, the OSM obviously looks better. I mean, it looked better on the it had a higher objective function too. Okay. Well, I suppose um, if you the notes here say that we used um, all of the data, so we do uh, uh, OSM, which is a subset of uses subsets of the data versus our gradient ascent uh, implementation, which uses all of the data. So that, in this particular implementation, the gradient ascent has an, an advantage there. Um, but then also, I suppose, you wouldn't always have this, you wouldn't always want to use a fixed tau value, right? So then you could potentially, um, uh, Chris was saying, you could do a line search to uh, each iteration to then find your new tau. So, but, or would I expect any, like, does one, for example, call that the noise, or? They're both convergent, aren't they? So they're, they're both optimizing the same objective, and they are the same. Yeah. And this objective function is nice and convex, and it's more than likely it has only one minimum, so then they could just call it maximum. Uh, yeah, so I can't remember. <laughs> I think so because there is a method called make positive, yeah. Okay, so uh, if you, uh, because we, in our objective function we take logarithms as the log, yes, and so if you take a logarithm of a negative number, it's not going to like it. Uh, so then there are a few ways to solve this particular one, but the easy way is to say, well, all my pixel values have to be positive. So that's why you do a gradient descent, but then you say, oh, I truncate all negative numbers back to zero. So that means it's constrained uh, gradient descent, not quite a normal thing. So a lot of the theory on step sizes breaks down anyway. Uh, so what people, people do is you can precondition your gradient descent thing, and there's, um, there is an algorithm in there that does that for you. Uh, and then the step size is only become a little bit more reasonable, uh, more predictable. Mm. But MLEM imposes a positive deconstraint, and if you do gradient descent with positive deconstraint again, you should converge to the same solution. 
but nobody wants to use max and likelihood solution anyway. It's lousy. <laughs> you want to do that once you have a penalty. But this is like phase one is happening now, and phase two is happening now. Yeah, so, so they could use like oh, yeah, like that. In 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 mechanic, pretty much all manufacturers have OSCM implemented. Some of them still have put their back projection. Uh, they start to drop it now. And then uh, I believe at this point in time, GE is the only one that has a, a, a map algorithm, a penalized algorithm, which they call QTA. But I'm sure tomorrow we'll see if we get one. With their kind of but, yeah. Um, but that, yeah, so in practice, so you, you, you look at that image and you say, well, 32 looks fine. And that's where you stop, because if you do 320, try it. Yeah. It yeah. Look fun and then I hadn't read this, but. Uh, this is what we were just talking about, where uh, you could effectively do a line search to figure out your optimal tau values. Anybody knows how you would want to add more noise to the data? Any examples? The more Poisson, the more it's Poisson. So what do you do if, if you want to have more noise in Poisson data? You add the background. You, you, you reduce counts. Yes. Yeah. So you would say I have, I have my mean acquisition data, but now I multiply it to the factor smaller than one. Gives you Fewer counts and then do the Poisson noise stuff and that is only for measure. So it's more than those. So yeah, that would correspond to injecting uh, less activity or measuring for short sure. periods. Okay. Everybody still with me? Yes, so at the moment we don't have a background term anyway, so we're not, not really. There's actually a 